Next up, we're going to take a step back and go through a day-by-day account of what happened during Goss's escape and capture, the riot, and the lead-up to preparations for trials of Goss and of the mob members in Bakersville. We begin on Wednesday, September 26, 1923. The event that starts the Spruce Pine Race Riot begins when inmate John Goss decides to leave the prison detail where he is working on the Spruce Pine to Ledger section of today's North Carolina Highway 226 as part of a road gang. He gets on a truck, rides some distance, jumps off, and disappears into the underbrush to escape. Goss makes his way to Googe's Creek near Spruce Pine where he encounters Mrs. Melvina Silver, He apparently asks for a drink of water from her. He then leaves Mrs. Silver and walks on up the road where he next encounters Alice Thomas, who is walking on the road near her home around noon that day. Goss allegedly criminally assaults her, then runs into the woods to escape. Alice Thomas goes home and relates what happened to her family. A posse is quickly organized by her husband Mac and sons to go after the unidentified assailant. The number of members of the posse starts to grow as reports circulate about the event throughout Spruce Pine. Additional men join the hunt for Goss, but their initial search proves unsuccessful. While Mrs. Thomas's sons and some law enforcement officers forge ahead in the search for Goss, the other members of the posse return to Spruce Pine. The group of men who gathered to help hunt for Goss gets boisterous and rowdy. Alcohol begins to flow. Guns are brandished. Someone in the group hears that the man had come from the Hawkins Mine area, which is on the other side of the mountain from the Thomas home. This mine has a group of African-American workers brought in for jobs. Some of those have brought families with them. These outsiders had always rubbed the locals the wrong way, so the group decides to take care of the outsider problem by sending them all away. As they start back to Spruce Pine from participating in the search, someone else points out that a company of African-American workers from the Fisk Carter Construction Company are toiling on the water and sewer project just across the Tow River from downtown. The decision is made to go after them and start the removal process there. Mayor A.N. Fuller and Herbert Hickey, a prominent citizen of Spruce Pine, both get word that the group was on their way back to town and were beginning to make threats to the African-American workers. They then attempt to meet and break up the mob, asking them to let the law handle the matter concerning Mrs. Thomas. The mob ignores their pleas and continues on to town. While Mayor Fuller and Mr. Hickey are attempting to reason with the mob, Police Chief L.H. Wright and Colonel D.W. Adams head to the bridge, getting word to the Fisk Carter camp about the commotion and encouraging them to pack up and move away. The company complies and removes their work crew from the area. The two men then position themselves on the bridge in a last stand to prevent the mob from crossing to the camp. The mob arrives at the bridge and begins to try to cross it. Wright and Adams hold their ground, telling the group that they're not going to be allowed to cross to the work camp. One of the mob members aims the shotgun at Chief Wright. The chief pulls two revolvers and aims them back at the man with the shotgun. Some men in the mob attempt to overpower the man with the shotgun. He fires the gun, but they hit his arm just as he pulls the trigger, forcing the shot to go wild. It hits no one. This is the only shot fired by the mob while they are pursuing their objective of removing the African Americans from Spruce Pine. Wright and Adams stand their ground on the bridge, and the mob then backs away and disperses. After this incident, Mayor Fuller sends a telegram to Governor Cameron Morrison stating what had just happened in Spruce Pine and requesting his assistance at putting down the disturbance. It is now Thursday, September 27, 1923. Somewhere in this time frame, word gets around that the assailant was an escaped prisoner by the name of John Goss, whose name was incorrectly reported in some accounts as John Goff, G-O-F-F. But this does not deter the mob's actions in removing workers from the local mines and road projects. The mob resumes their activities of removing the African-American workers. They go to the Hawkins and Wiseman mines, rounding up 26 there and marching them to the Spruce Pine train depot. An additional 50 workers at the Porter and Boyd work camp on the Spruce Pine to Ledger Road project are rounded up along with an additional 25 others in the area around the mines and road project. 
all of these men are marched to Spruce Pine by the mob. They were forced onto trains at the depot in downtown Spruce Pine and sent south toward Marion. Next, the mob returns to the shanty town, rounding up the women and children and sending them out of town on a separate train. Other African Americans get word of what's taking place in Spruce Pine and decide on their own to leave the area. Around 3 p.m. on September 27th, an estimated 150 men, while some reports state that only 80 men are involved, march to the O'Brien Construction Company of Birmingham, Alabama's worksite on Project 800, that's the road being built from the Mitchell County line to Plumtree in Avery County. As the group approaches, some of the African Americans head into the woods. The mob demands that the workers be marched to Spruce Pine, where they'll be placed on a train to leave. P.H. O'Brien, owner of the company, pleads with the mob to leave his workers alone, stating that they are, quote, law-abiding citizens, unquote, and had nothing to do with the assault on Mrs. Thomas. He gets a reprieve from the mob as long as he removes his workers by noon on September 28th. After the mob leaves, O'Brien asks both Mitchell County Sheriff R.C. Forbes and Avery County Sheriff Patrick A. Vance to provide protection for his workers or to call on the National Guard to provide the protection. Both sheriffs refuse the request, saying they can do nothing with the situation. Receiving no help, O'Brien next moves his workers to the Plumtree area of Avery County, where he then takes them on to Tennessee and they'll work on another project. There is one thing to note from all accounts found of these events. It is mentioned that the mob's behavior was unusually calm, even with the drinking and guns being shown. Mayor Fuller even notes that no violence occurs to the African Americans beyond their harassment and forced march to the drain depot. And now to dispel a rumor that has circulated for decades. When Chris Hollifield and I were working on the Spruce Pine book for Arcadia Publishing, several individuals shared this photo you're seeing here with us, stating that it was one of the trains taking the African Americans out of town. But I can tell you today that it is not. If you look closely at the photo, the brick Spruce Pine store building is missing. The brick building housing the store was constructed and opened in the 1920-21 time frame, and it is not present here. This photo was made sometime before work began on that project in 1920. While the African Americans are being placed on the trains and shipped out, the wheels are in motion for a response from Governor Morrison. He answers Mayor Fuller's request with a telegraphed reply, quote, Please call on local authorities to uphold the law and protect everybody in their rights, including the colored people. I'm directing Adjutant General Metz to leave for Spruce Pine tonight. I will afford all protection the local authorities may require. Morrison's office next issues a statement to the press about the situation in Spruce Pine. Here's the text of that release. Quote, a serious situation has arisen at Spruce Pine in Mitchell County, which caused the governor to dispatch Adjutant General Metz there by the first train. He is instructed to keep in touch with developments and advise the governor immediately if any assistance is needed in maintaining law and order. The governor late this afternoon received a telegram from local authorities indicating that there has been some movement started toward driving colored labor away from the place. He immediately informed the authorities that he would afford the community ample protection in order to safeguard the rights of all its citizens, both white and colored, if necessary. Next, Morrison issues Special Orders Numbers 317, 1 and 2 to Adjutant General Metz and the North Carolina National Guard. These orders state, quote, Brigadier General J. Van B. Metz, the Adjutant General, is directed to proceed to Spruce by North Carolina to investigate and report conditions to the Governor in connection with the race disturbance in Mitchell County. Upon completion of the duties incidental to the conditions mentioned, the Adjutant General will return to his home station. The expense enjoined is necessary in the public service." Unquote. Metz immediately begins preparations for a train trip to Spruce Pine. We now move to Friday, September 28, 1923. The National Association of Colored People, better known as the NAACP, received information on the riot in Spruce Pine 
and they telegrammed Governor Morrison, quote, Press dispatches report that an armed mob of 200 citizens of Spruce Pine, North Carolina, are today rounding up all male Negroes in Spruce Pine and vicinity and deporting them on freight trains because of an alleged attack by a Negro on an aged white woman. National Association for the Advancement of Colored People is requesting of you information regarding correctness of this report and is also asking that you as governor of the state use all power at your command to protect the civil and constitutional rights of colored citizens who are being driven from their homes and jobs regardless of their innocence or guilt. Walter F. White, Assistant Secretary. Morrison replied to White's request with a curt response, quote, my actions in matter referred to by you are being given to Associated Press as quickly as can be done as to prevent action of state being prematurely made known to the lawless from whom we seek to protect the state. Stop. You can get information through the news sources at the rest of the public acquire it. Unquote. Meanwhile, General Metz arrived in Spruce Pine on September 28th and met with officials to discuss the situation. He decided to begin a mobilization of the National Guard to Spruce Pine. In Special Order 319, he directed Troop F, 2nd Squadron, 109th Cavalry of Asheville, and Company B, 105th Engineers of Morganton, to activate and travel to Spruce Pine with the, quote, least practical delay, unquote. Soldiers began arriving in Spruce Pine within hours of those orders going out. Spruce Pine officials also announced that a reward of $500, that's about $8,600 in today's money, was being offered by the town for Goss's capture in addition to the $400 reward, which is just about $6,900 in today's money that Governor Morrison offered for his capture. As the troops started arriving, Metz appointed Major Edmund Pendleton E.P. Robinson of North Wilkesboro as the commanding officer of the expedition. He is pictured here with General Metz not long after he arrived in Spruce Pine. Note that Metz did not wear his uniform while he was here. I'm guessing this was to make him inconspicuous until the guardsman arrived so he could evaluate the situation. Now, as I noted, troops began arriving on the evening of September 28, 1923. That's 143 years to the day after the ragtag over-mountain men from Virginia and Tennessee arrived in Spruce Pine to camp for the evening. They were on their way to the Battle of Kings Mountain on October 7, 1780, and they camped in the area which today hosts the Grassy Creek Golf and Country Club along with Spruce Pine's two shopping centers. Pictured here is a photo of Troop F, 2nd Squadron, the 109th Cavalry of Asheville, posing on their horses. This ran on the front page of the Asheville Times when they announced the troops' deployment. At the height of the mobilization, 250 National Guardsmen are in Spruce Pine, the largest number ever sent in a police action in guard history in North Carolina at the time. Newspaper reports state that the citizens of Spruce Pine were, quote, surprised, unquote, when troops started arriving. They had no inkling that they had been called to the scene through requests by town officials. Morrison also started to receive correspondence from the affected companies, like this letter from R. Fred Brewer, general manager of the Clinchfield Products Corporation of Irwin, Tennessee, and operator of the Hawkins Mine. A couple of highlights from that letter are as follows. Quote, it has been utterly impossible to secure sufficient labor in this section to operate our mines. Therefore, it has been necessary for us to bring this labor in. Some of the men we've had have been with us for a number of years, and the writer knows that they were reliable and law-abiding citizens." Unquote. Brewer also called on Governor Morrison to put a stop to such behavior in Spruce Pine. Quote, I know that Your Excellency will not condone such unlawful procedure as mentioned above, and we hope that you will take such action as will certainly prevent a repetition of this kind of lawlessness." Unquote. North Carolina residents start to hear about the riot in the news stories reported in papers all over the region, and soon the nation. Some of these reports are very national inquirer in nature, with sensational headlines and lurid details while others take a more calm and restrained approach. 
I'll be citing from reports of various papers as we move forward, and if I include something, we've corroborated that report cited by verifying it with multiple sources. Also, I'd like to point out that often these sources will use words that we find offensive and detrimental in today's vernacular. Now, I'm not trying to be insensitive or disrespectful here. I am sharing with you what it was like in 1923 Spruce Pine. This here is an example headline from the Asheville Times. The reports generally summarize the events and Governor Morrison's actions to order the National Guard to Spruce Pine to quell the disturbance. Mayor Fuller states in an interview with the Raleigh News and Observer that local people would not do the work going on around town, so it was necessary for the companies to get outside help to do their work and that he, Fuller, wanted it to be safe for them to do their jobs here. Now, as I mentioned earlier, some accounts misidentify Goss as Goff, but we will be using his last name Goss going forward. As these reports start to circulate, Newspapers order their reporters to begin journeys to cover what happens, and they start arriving in Spruce Pine around September 28th and 29th. Here is an example headline from the Winston-Salem Journal from September 28, 1923. We move on to Saturday, September 29, 1923. The third day of the crisis in Spruce Pine opens with a telegram from Governor Morrison to General Metz stating that the prison camp at Spruce Pine should be, quote, protected at every cost, unquote, and orders him to inform Mitchell County Sheriff Forbes that the National Guard will, quote, uphold the law and sustain him and protect Negro laborers in their right to work in county, unquote. In particular, Morrison tells Metz that, quote, if Sheriff will not do his duty in your opinion, Notify me, unquote. Metz replies that the prison camp is safe, but describes the atmosphere in Spruce Pine as being, quote, charged, unquote. Now let me start by first apologizing in advance for the quality of some of the images we're going to be showing in the following slides. They are lifted from newspapers of the time, and their historical value is such that I feel it's worth showing them. Troops spent their first night in a local warehouse and ate at local restaurants. Then on September 29th, they began assembling a camp and establishing a defensive position at today's Riverside Park in downtown Spruce Pine. They named their position Camp Mitchell, the headquarters of which was in a house located where the current fellowship hall of First Baptist Church sits today. And in this photo, this is the Morganton troop posing at the headquarters. I'd like to note that the photo was taken by George Massa, who was a famous photographer from the era that recorded many beautiful views in western North Carolina. He was based in Asheville and took many famous photos, many of which can be seen at Pack Memorial Library, UNC Asheville, and Western Carolina University. You will see other photos he took for the Asheville Citizen and the Asheville Times as we continue, but the originals of these photos have been lost. Here, officers pose at Camp Mitchell for Massa. Of course, the Asheville Citizen didn't miss an opportunity for self-promotion. Here they show soldiers from Asheville reading the Citizen while in camp so they could be, quote, caught up on the latest news, unquote. This photo is of a unit from Concord that was eventually sent to join the others in Spruce Pine. That's a terrible picture, but I include it because it was taken roughly where the playground and amphitheater in Riverside Park sit today. The house in the upper left of the image is the old Swan House, and it is still standing. National Guardsmen dug trenches all along the Tow River facing downtown. Massa photographed soldiers with their guns trained on downtown from these trench positions. And yes, the National Guard actually did set up machine gun nests with their weapons trained on downtown Spruce Pine. This photo confirms that report. It is my understanding that there were at least three of them established. Now, we don't have a photo of one of the machine gun nests actually set up, but we can see the ammunition for the guns was on display at the headquarters. Meanwhile, the manhunt for Goss continued. 
On September 29th, the tip to Burke County authorities that he was spotted in the Morganton train station early that morning turned out to be correct. Burke and Catawba County law enforcement officials caught up with him near Hickory and arrested him while the posse from Spruce Pine waited in Morganton. The officers found Goss eating crackers and cheese. He put up no fight, surrendering to them for arrest. To reduce the possibility of a lynching, Sheriff George Bost of Catawba County put Goss on a train bound for Raleigh and the state prison escorted by his officers. When Goss arrived in Greensboro around midnight on the 29th, he gave an interview to the Greensboro News and Record. In the interview, he stated he didn't know a posse was out after him and that he, quote, jumped from a truck and ran into the underbrush, unquote. Later, he said he went to Johnson City on the train, then to Morganton, and boarded a train at Drexel, after which he was shortly caught. He also shared the story of his conviction in 1913, which he said was a, quote, conspiracy among his Negro enemies, unquote. This was the only report that mentioned him riding a train to Johnson City. We have no way of confirming that this happened, as there are no invests of the Clinchfield Railroad trains on file for the area in the Railroad Archives at East Tennessee State University. Goss arrived at State Prison in Raleigh at 4.30 a.m. September 30th and was promptly placed in a holding cell. Now, in a wide-ranging article about the riot events in the Raleigh News and Observer, Governor Morrison made two statements of note on September 29th. First, he said, quote, I think prisoners should be treated humanely and their welfare should be promoted, but while they are prisoners, I maintain they should be treated as prisoners. I think they should be worked under guns. If they are qualified to enjoy freedom and unrestricted association outside the camp, then they ought to be pardoned, unquote. Plus, the governor couldn't help but give a plug for his good roads efforts in the NNO story by noting that the rapid movement of troops like that being done at Spruce Pine was a justification for building the improved roads. Quote, Suppose with bad roads and in the dead of winter, lawlessness should break out in some of our mountain counties. Why, we would have to wait until spring opens to get troops there. With a good road from Marion to Spruce Pine, troops might have been thrown into the place in little more than an hour, unquote, according to Morrison. Adjutant General Metz departed Spruce Pine upon the arrival of troops on the evening of September 28th. He granted an interview with the Raleigh News and Observer as he was leaving, outlining the events that occurred in a timeline fashion and making three observations of note. On Mitchell County Sheriff R.C. Forbes, Metz stated that he learned that throughout the rioting, nothing was seen of Sheriff Forbes until the mid-morning of Thursday. He was said to have watched the Negroes being loaded into the cars, but didn't protest. About Forbes, Metz said, quote, He's a Republican, as is the entire county, and he took office last December. Some weeks ago, Judge Ray, that is Judge Biss Ray from Burnsville, had warned Forbes from the bench that unless he was more vigorous in enforcing the law, he was going to find a new sheriff, unquote. Secondly, Metz stated that, quote, most of the men in the mob are said not to be residents of the town, but came in from outlying sections of the county, unquote. And finally, Metz is the only source that stated that Mrs. Thomas was harmed in the attack. In this article, he described her as being, quote, badly cut, unquote. He sent Governor Morrison a telegram while en route back to Raleigh, stating that the guard was ready to protect the workers as they returned and that the situation was, quote, quiet today, but precaution was being observed, unquote. It is now Sunday, September 30th, 1923. This marks the arrival of more men and equipment from Troop F in Asheville and the 105th Engineers of Morganton to bolster their presence in Spruce Pine. It was also reported in the papers at this time that Major Robinson had arrived to assume command of the soldiers earlier in the week. September 30th is also the first day that reports of Goss's capture appear in the newspapers. A report in the Asheville Citizen identifies the five-man posse that was chasing Goss off the mountain and into Burke County. They were Deputy Mac Buchanan, Dexter Buchanan, who was Alice Thomas's son-in-law, Wilburn and Nellis Thomas, her sons, and Clyde Ledford. A discussion of the trustee system for prisoners takes place in several articles. 
Governor Morrison stated that it was something that was going to be reviewed in light of Goss's escape, along with similar issues with the system. However, that trusty system continues for another decade in the state prison. And in an exclusive bombshell photo, the Raleigh News and Observer publishes this image of some of the members of the mob posing by the train depot. Authorities used this picture to identify those involved in the insurrection, and discussion by state authorities begins on arresting them for their actions. The Asheville Citizen also publishes a story on this date, stating that workers in the road building, sewer and water main constructions, were being paid $2.75 a day. That's about $48 in today's money for their labors. F.A. Carr, editor of the Tow River Herald, which was Spruce Pine's first newspaper, is quoted as saying, Every white man in the county who wants to work and is willing to give an honest day's work for a day's pay is at work. It is now Monday, October 1, 1923. The next phase of the crisis begins. With Goss incarcerated at Raleigh, Governor Morrison telegraphs Sheriff R.C. Forbes and asks him to begin the process of calling a special session of court to try Goss. Morrison also requests that Forbes look into getting Mrs. Thomas to travel to Raleigh to positively identify her attacker at the state's expense. Morrison also asked General Metz to begin the process of getting Alice Thomas to Raleigh to identify Goss. He also makes mention of a special term of court in this telegram that should be held quickly as possible, in his opinion, even though Metz cannot have any effect on the Superior Court term in Mitchell County. General Metz responds to Morrison with a status report that all is quiet, with troops on alert and patrolling the streets of Spruce Pine. Metz issues Special Order 320 on October 1st, sending Company E, 120th Infantry of Concord, North Carolina, with additional men to bolster the number of soldiers on duty. On this day, Governor Morrison received a letter from the Rev. W. H. Hunt of Birmingham, Alabama. Rev. Hunt asked the governor to see that the African Americans do not, quote, suffer and be driven away from their homes on account of what one bad member of his race does, unquote. He does thank Morrison for the effort that he displayed in the matter in trying to protect the lives of the humble and innocent people who dwell in the community. We do not have a record of a response from Morrison to Hunt's request. Media accounts of the impending return of African Americans to their jobs in the Spruce Pine area begin to build as they're expected to arrive back in town on October 1st. The Raleigh News and Observer confirms that their camera and film was seized by authorities in an effort to identify the mob members for prosecution. The Asheville Citizen reports that they're told that 15 to 20 shots were fired in the night in the northern section of town, prompting National Guardsmen to disperse in the night to search for the perpetrators, but no one was found. This is not reported anywhere else, so it's unconfirmed. Several newspaper reports do note that Goss vehemently denied attacking Alice Thomas. He at first stated that he never saw her, but later the papers report he was trying to steal a pair of shoes from her, and he ran off when he couldn't get them. African-American workers began to dribble back into Spruce Pine on October 1st with eight men from the Fisk Carter Construction Company, the contractor for the water and sewer improvements, arriving back in town for work. They were immediately surrounded by 30 National Guardsmen as they got off the train and were escorted to their camp across the bridge. The men then began their work. The guards stayed at the work site to protect them from any problems with harassment. Twelve other men with Fisk Carter refused to return to work in Spruce Pine, saying they wanted to stay in a, quote, more peaceful region, unquote. October 1st also saw the first inkling of a subplot involving politics that took place during the riots. The Asheville Citizen reported that Peter Biddix and E.O. Green were arrested by Police Chief Wright and charged with breach of the peace and tending to incite the people. The two men were accused of circulating a petition in town that alleged Mayor Fuller was illegally holding office. Now, it should be noted that Fuller was a Democrat, while Biddix was a staunch Republican. The indictment stated that the two, quote, did unlawfully and willfully and with felonious intent breach the peace by creating and circulating a petition to oust the town authorities, 
to wit the mayor, and which conduct in view of the tense times is circulated to further incite the citizens to riot and to mob violence in view of the recent riot action, unquote. The two men alleged in their petition that a $75,000 bond issue for Spruce Pine was illegally issued, which I'm guessing was for the water and sewer project, and that Fuller was not properly elected to the office by the vote of the people. Fuller answered this charge by saying he was elected mayor in May 1922 by the Board of Aldermen when Dr. Charles Peterson, who was then mayor, stepped aside due to his election to the North Carolina House of Representatives. Under state law, he couldn't legally hold both offices at the same time. The two men appeared before Mayor Fuller after their arrest, then they were bound over for trial by Justice of the Peace Bennett and were released on $200 bond. That's about $3,450 in today's money. In another twist on a similar story, North Carolina Attorney General James Manning was in Pennsylvania on October 1st in an effort to extradite Doc McCoy, an African American who had been charged with murder in Nash County. The NAACP filed a brief with Governor Gifford Pinchot opposing the extradition, stating that McCoy would not get a fair trial in North Carolina. Pinchot proceeded with the extradition, and McCoy was tried in Nash County, where he was later convicted and sentenced to 30 years for murder. Oddly enough, the NAACP did not file any sort of brief opposing Gosses being tried in Mitchell County due to it not being a fair trial location. Finally, in association with this story, Attorney General Manning's son, John Hall Manning, was a lieutenant in the North Carolina National Guard and was on duty in Spruce Pine at the time his father was in Pennsylvania for the extradition hearing. Attention of both local residents and National Guard commanders began to turn to the upcoming Tow River Fair. There was much concern over whether the event would be safe to take place, and there was worry that violence could break out if crowds gathered for the fair. General Metz came back to Spruce Pine and met with fair officials and decided to go ahead with the fair as scheduled. But he also told organizers that at any sign of the slightest disorder, he would shut the fair down. Metz talked with J.L. Cronin, the owner of the Carnival Company, bringing the axe to the fair. Cronin had a musical review staged by 17 African Americans that had been popular at past fairs. He wanted to bring them back to the Tow River Fair. Metz told Cronin no, saying that it was best to leave that troupe in Marion. Cronin disobeyed the order and brought the minstrel show on up the mountain. When they arrived in Spruce Pine, Metz would not let them get off the train. Instead, he sent them on to Johnson City to wait for the carnival to finish its run, then they could rejoin the tour to go to other locations. As part of the planning for the Tow River Fair, Spruce Pine officials passed a special proclamation that was in effect during the fair governing those attending. Now, here are the particulars of that proclamation. Number one. No one would be permitted to enter Spruce Pine unusually or dangerously armed, openly, or concealed. Officials would seize arms and hold them, allowing owners to retrieve them by applying to authorities. However, under state law, concealed weapons would be confiscated and destroyed and violators prosecuted. Number two. Bringing liquor into the Spruce Pine city limits would not be permitted, and any found would be destroyed and those transporting it would be arrested and held for a court appearance. Number three, authorities would search for arms and whiskeys as provided for by law. Guards were stationed on all five roads leading into Spruce Pine to check for contraband. Number four, no drunkenness or disorderly conduct will be permitted. Number five, the sale of firearms and ammunition within the city limits is suspended from October 2nd to the 6th. Number six, those with the carnival must remain in the fairgrounds after 10 p.m. during the fair's run. Number seven, the fair will close at 10 p.m. and visitors will vacate the premises. Number eight, Stores, restaurants, and vendors in Spruce Pine will be required to close at 10 p.m. while the proclamation is in effect. And number nine, if conditions of insurrection, riot, or invasion continue beyond the fair's closing date of October 6th, the conditions of the proclamation will remain in effect. 
This proclamation went into effect at sunrise on October 2nd and continued until midnight October 6th, the date of the close of the fair. We now move to Tuesday, October 2nd, 1923. Alice and Mac Thomas boarded a Clinchfield train in Spruce Pine and began their journey to Raleigh to identify the perpetrator of the crime. This photo from the newspaper is of Mrs. Thomas at the depot preparing to board the train. As she left, Alice told reporters, quote, I do hope they have the right man. I feel certain I can identify the man who attacked me. If the man at Raleigh is not the man, I believe I can tell it, unquote. The Wilson Times reported that rumors are rampant in Spruce Pine of $300 bounties on the heads of both Mayor Fuller and Colonel D.W. Adams. Other rumors reported in papers claimed that groups of men were going north and south of Spruce Pine to prevent any African Americans from returning to work. Now, these rumors, of course, all proved to be false. The Asheville Times reported that Frank Page, chairman of the State Highway Commission, stated that he would go before the state prison board and request that inmates be sent to Mitchell County to complete the road between Spruce Pine and Bakersville and Spruce Pine to the Avery County Line project. O'Brien Construction and Porter and Boyd apparently indicated that they could not fulfill their contracts to finish the projects. Page noted that both sections were scheduled to be completed by December 1923. The Raleigh News and Observer next summarized the situation as follows, quote, The streets are closely guarded, and with the extension of operations tomorrow when the fair begins, the extra company will be needed. Two squads are on duty at the convict camp five miles out, but they're having a dull time of it. They have not been molested. If riot comes, the soldiers will be able to handle. Machine guns command the town from every direction. They have tear gas bombs ready to lay down among any rioters that congregate in numbers. Machine guns cover all the hills from which any sniping might start. The situation is well in hand, and it begins to look like the soldiers will have to stay here for no little time. Withdrawn, the Negroes would be instantly at the mercy of the rioters again. It will take education or conversion or something of the sort to clear up Mitchell County, unquote. Governor Morrison gets his first pushback on his desire to have Goss's trial as soon as possible. Mitchell County Commission Chairman Joseph Griffith wired Morrison, stating that while they had received his request for a special session of court, the county commission suggested that the trial be held the first day of the November term of court. Griffith cited that there is doubt if the solicitor could attend before November. However, Griffith leaves the door open for Morrison, stating that if the situation requires a special term, he could order it and the county would draw a jury. Mayor Fuller sent a letter to E.W. Lentz, the chief of police in Hickory, concerning the $500 in reward money that Spruce Pine had offered for Goss's capture. In the letter, Fuller stated the town's reward was to be divided between the parties who participated in the capture, and it was his opinion that the Mitchell County Deputy Sheriff and Mrs. Thomas's four sons and son-in-law, along with her nephew, should split the reward since they, quote, drove the prisoner into the arms of the men who captured him since they trailed him out of the mountain country on into the point of capture, unquote. Morrison also received requests from companies seeking to profit from Spruce Pine's misfortunes. O. Arthur Kirkman of the High Point, Thomasville, and Denton Railroad Company wrote the governor, telling him that his company could use 50 of the African-American men from Spruce Pine. The Charlotte Observer and other papers reported that Mrs. Viola Lawfridge, who was the daughter of Jason E. Burleson of Burleson Micafane, brought three African Americans, one man and two women, back to Spruce Pine on October 1st from Burnsville in an automobile. One of the three worked as a cook for her, while the other two worked at the two hotels in Spruce Pine, the Topliff and the Umatella hotels that are shown here. Mrs. Lawfridge declined military protection for her and the three African Americans, telling the Charlotte paper that she, quote, was unafraid and could and would protect them herself, unquote. It was reported that Mrs. Lawfridge was a crack shot and could take care of any situation that arose. 
Also on October 2nd, warrants began to be served to the identified leaders of the mob. Now let's note here that October 3rd, a Wednesday, seemed to be a fairly quiet day with little in the way of news. Now we move on to October 4th, 1923. It was reported that Alice Thomas positively identified John Goss at the state prison on October 3rd. She allegedly said, sure, it's him, when seeing Goss at the prison. Upon hearing the news, one of her sons told a Johnson City newspaper, quote, We are glad they have got the right man. We trailed this man over 70 miles in the mountains and would have gone to Mexico if necessary to arrest him, unquote. Alice, Mack, and the Mitchell County deputy that accompanied them returned to Spruce Pine on the evening of October 4th. After Alice Thomas identified Goss in the state prison, Governor Morrison goes into action, establishing his agenda for what he wanted to happen. He informed the Mitchell County Commission that a special session of Superior Court would be held in Mitchell County on October 22nd with Judge T.B. Finley presiding. He commands the County Commission to call a jury for the special session of court. Next, he sends a telegram to District Solicitor Johnson J. Hayes stating that he insists that the special term of Mitchell County Superior Court be held on October 22nd in Bakersville and that he has already called the session and ordered Judge Finley to preside. Judge Thomas Brown T.B. Finley is up next. Morrison's telegram insists that the second week of Avery County Superior Court in October be suspended and that a special term of Mitchell County Court be held beginning October 22nd. He gives Finley no choice, quote, have called it with you presiding, unquote. And last but not least, Sheriff R.C. Forbes is informed via telegram that the special session of court has been called and that he is instructed to call a jury for the session. It's now been five days since we've heard anything from General Metz, but he issues Special Orders No. 327 on October 4th. In these orders, he instructs Captain B.M. Bradford with the Medical Detachment 2nd Squadron, 109th Cavalry, North Carolina National Guard in Lincolnton to proceed to Spruce Pine with one sergeant and two enlisted men and to contact Metz when he arrives for orders. Metz also sends a telegram to liaison major Gordon Smith to inform Governor Morrison that troops had chased a gang into the mountains on October 3rd, but nothing had happened. They were worried about an attack brewing, but nothing could be proven that anything was planned. So now the waiting begins. In a Raleigh News and Observer article, Ben Dixon McNeil, who made the photo you're looking at on the screen, talks about how attendance at the Tow River Fair was the lowest it had been since it had started, even with a special horse-riding performance by Troop F of the National Guard being featured as an attraction. He also says that warrants for at least 75 members of the mob would go out and that troops would be stationed in Bakersville for all the trials. McNeil said that Metz had advised against arresting mob members, but also noted that few of them could post bond and that there was nowhere large enough to hold even a tenth of them in jail in Mitchell County. McNeil speculates that the proceedings against these men would be held on what are called bench warrants issued by Judge Finley, which give law enforcement the right to arrest on the spot and take the individual straight to court without being held in jail or posting bail. McNeil says that few searches of town visitors took place during the fair and that no illegal weapons or liquor was found on the searches. He also stated that a single shot was fired on the night of October 2nd that had Major Robinson out in pursuit. He ordered a stranger he chased to halt, shooting four times in the direction in an attempt to stop him, but the man fled. Troops combed Peterson Mountain, which is also known as Iowa Hill, above Spruce Pine until daybreak, but found nothing. McNeil continues in his story, citing mining industry representatives who said that the question of outside labor must be settled once and for all for the region. At the time of the incident, Mitchell and Yancey counties were producing 65% of all the kaolin, feldspar, and mica used in the United States. The industry had developed many times faster than the population in the region. This had resulted in labor having to be brought in to meet the demand. 
Locals had continued to complain that the imported labor cut down on wages paid to workers. The mining companies denied these charges, pointing out that the wages paid these workers were higher than those paid in the past in the mountains. The companies also stated that the same pay scale was available to everybody who wanted a job. The operators flat out stated in his report that there were not enough laborers to go around and they had to seek outside help to meet their needs. There are no state economic statistics that can be checked to verify any of these statements, short of one citation that I mentioned earlier that the miners made $2.75 a day. That's about equal to $48 in today's money. That appeared to be pretty good wages for the area at the time. McNeil concluded his article by saying, quote, Spruce Pine is further from Raleigh than is New York by rail, and as far removed as China as to other means of communications. There's a single telegraph line used by the railroad, and they've been helpful allowing it to be used by authorities in the press. Telephone operators have done, quote, prodigies of service, but McNeil laments that it's a long way across the mountains. However, all of that is about to rapidly change in the coming years. We turn our attention now to the trials of John Goss and those involved in the mob that were held in Bakersville in our next section.